Galatians chapter 5. You know, the singing has been really good today. I was encouraged to hear one, one of our visitors actually say that's one of the things that, um, I don't know if I would say is a, attracting him to the church, but he said that's one thing that stood out to him is he's really appreciated the singing uh, that he's been uh, hearing here at the church. So uh, just take that as an encouragement. Um, your expression in singing does speak. Uh, it speaks to others. And so just remember that as you are participating in singing, you're helping others. I don't have anything new to bring to you tonight. I hope you're not disappointed about that. In fact, I think you ought to be quite discouraged about that, If, especially on the Lord's Supper. I uh, had some sort of new twist to the gospel, you know. That would be a horrible thing, right? Uh, but I do hope that we'll be encouraged by the thoughts this evening and maybe even lead to some examination as well. Liberty in Christ. Galatians chapter 5 Begin, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. What is the liberty that we have in Christ? And what should we think when we hear, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty which Christ has made us, by which Christ has made us free? What should we be thinking? We know that this liberty depends upon Christ alone and is received by faith alone. It's the liberty by which Christ has made us free. There's no other way that we have this liberty but by Christ. But we're often tempted by perhaps false teaching or imbalanced emphasis of true doctrine to lose our footing and to question our freedom and to slip back under a yoke from which we have been made free. And therefore, it sounds to me like Paul is shouting here as he's coming toward the end of his theological reasoning in this book, and he is I hear him speaking very loudly when he says, stand fast, stand firm, persevere. Don't move off this platform of liberty that is secured for you by Christ. And so tonight as we remember him, we are assured that in our crucified, risen, and reigning Savior, we are free. We have liberty. And I want us to think about this for a few moments. And of course, if you are a partaker of the elements tonight, you should be partaking as a believer. If you're not, you don't partake. Uh, you could be a member of the church and not a believer. Uh, the assumption is that every member of the church is a believer. We don't believe in unregenerate church membership. But just simply having your name on a membership roll in a church doesn't make you a believer. So you need to examine that. But if you are a believer, and it is presumed, everything I'm saying tonight about your liberty, I'm saying it to those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you partake of these elements tonight, you need to remember some things. You need to remember that Christ has freed you. Christ has freed you. Christ has given you liberty. Christ has freed you from condemnation. You know these scriptures. Romans 8 and verse 1. 
By the way, in my opinion, Romans 8 verse 1 ought to be one of the believer's favorite go-to verses. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And in the Galatian letter, listen to the words of the apostle as he makes, using different language, but really saying much the same thing in Galatians 3, beginning in verse 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. That is the righteousness that is earned by way of the law. It's not of faith. And that's the point that he's dealing with. But Christ, verse 13, has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And this applies in particular to the Jew, but also to any Gentile who would want to, as the Jews were wanting to, lead, lead Gentiles back under the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Christ has freed us from what we justly deserve. Do you believe that you deserve condemnation? I had to think about that. Now, theologically, I would say yes, because I know my theology, right? And Y'all know your theology. But do I really believe that I deserve condemnation? Do I believe that I deserve to suffer under the curse? The curse that was placed upon humanity from the beginning? Or the curse that is announced under the law? Do I believe that I deserve the curse? Do I deserve condemnation? If I really believe I deserve that, then how amazing is it to hear no condemnation, no curse? How sweet the sound for a sinner like me. Stand fast, he says. Don't be moved. Stand fast in this liberty. Let no accusation from the enemy shake you from what you have in Christ. No condemnation, no curse. We should also remember, as we think about this liberty, tonight, Remember that Christ has freed you from the dominion of sin. Which means sin is not your master. And sin cannot rob you of eternal life. It can't do it. You're free. You have liberty. Romans chapter 6, verse 2, Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? That's our relationship to sin. We've died in relationship to sin. So sin does not have the relationship to us that it once had. And what relationship was that? It reigned over us. Because it reigned over us, death reigned over us, which he has just stated in the end of chapter 5, Romans chapter 5. And then skipping down to, uh, to Romans 6, verses 20 through 22. For when you were slaves of sin, that characterizes who you were before you were made free. Slaves of sin, you were 
free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. Sin still seeks to distract us and disturb us, and it even seeks to destroy us. But it can't. It can't. Paul says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Why is that, Paul? Well, because you're not under law, you're under grace, you see. Grace. And in verse 23, he concludes, Romans 6, For the wages of sin is death, and if, if sin is your master, then it's going to pay you. It's a paymaster. That's what the wages here really is talking about. It'll pay you. What it pays you is death, not just physical death. But the gift of God, that's a gift of grace which he talked about in Romans chapter 5. And really, Romans 6.23 is sort of concluding what he was talking about at the end of Romans chapter 5. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, Romans 8.2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You, you see, we're talking about the liberty that we have in Christ here. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Grace in Christ Jesus has set us free. So sin can harass us. It does. Is there anyone in here that doesn't do battle with sin? Is there anyone in here that has that, that sin is just an irrelevant issue to you as far as you having to deal with it, mortify it, fight it? No, sin can still harass us. But we have power to resist and we have power to overcome. And guess what? When we do sin, we have an advocate. That's the one we're remembering tonight. We have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. This is our liberty, you see. This is our freedom. And there's no need to grovel in the depths of despair of guilt over sin. That is not how you get liberated. That is not how you get maintain that you get or maintain freedom. There may be some of you who think, Preacher, I did something this last week. And I just don't feel like I feel guilty enough about it yet to say that I'm free. Do you hear what's going on there? You're trying to earn your freedom? You are already free. It's a matter of receiving that freedom, living in that freedom. Should you feel bad about sin? Well, if you don't feel bad about sin, sin that you've committed, if you don't feel bad about it, something's wrong with you. If you're a believer, you've offended your Father in heaven. You, how can you not feel bad about that? But feeling bad about it is not what frees you. I mean, if, if that's true, then at what point can you say you're free? If it's dependent upon the degree of your feeling guilty, which some people teach. You haven't felt guilty enough yet. Therefore, you're not free. That's not biblical. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free, by which Christ has made you. You free. Remember that tonight. And then remember. 
I mean, can I just insert here just for a moment that if you have been struggling with some sense of guilt of sin in anything in your life, it ought to move you in some emotional way perhaps tonight as you as you sit before these elements and as you take these elements, it ought to maybe bring a tear to you to know that there is nothing that you need to do to earn forgiveness. You're free in Christ. That ought to produce a thankful spirit from you, a worshipful spirit in you. But then remember, also, that Christ has freed you from the bondage or yoke of the law as a covenant. And this is really one of the main things he's, he's dealing with here in Galatians chapter 5. Verses 1 through 6, we read verse 1. Indeed, Paul says, I say to you, that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. There is no liberty in going backwards. You will not gain freedom by going backwards to the shadows. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. And he's talking here to most likely those Gentiles who are being tempted to go back and do the Jewish thing. Which would have been right to do under the old covenant. But not now. You have become estranged from Christ, and that is, that's, you don't want that. You who attempt to be justified by, by law, you've fallen from grace. You, you haven't understood grace. And some believe that he's speaking here to unbelievers and telling them, Falling from grace means you've fallen from the, from the only thing that was being held up before you to actually give you freedom and give you liberty. And of course, that's true. Maybe he's speaking to those, but I believe he's speaking to true believers here. If not exclusively, at least we could say, as well as. I mean, that's the whole context here. And to to fall from grace is not falling out of grace, but from the very thing that has brought you to where you are, and that is being in Christ. And having this liberty, this freedom. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Not by works, but by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. We're children of promise, aren't we? And Paul has already argued this back in chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Here he's speaking of Jew and Gentile. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. For if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. Skipping over to chapter 4, verse 21. Let's just read through the end of the chapter. Because he begins chapter 5 with stand fast, therefore. There, that's, he's saying, based upon what I've been telling you. And what has he just been saying? Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. By the way, Abraham preceded the Mosaic law. 
So when he's saying, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? He may not be specifically talking about the Mosaic law, but he is talking about that period, that time back there before the cross. But he, verse 23, he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic, an allegory. For these are the two covenants. And then he moves to Mount Sinai, the law, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this, and that's fleshly. In fact, Hebrews talks about that, the carnal ordinances of the law. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. The descendants of Abraham and Sarah, we might say. Or in other words, the descendants of the promised seed. Those who are the promised seed are far more. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Carnal religion does not like true spiritual religion. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we're not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Stand fast therefore. There were Jews then and some now, not Jews, who want to remain under the old covenant or tack the new onto the old. The old covenant law that identified national Israel and under which they were bound to live until Christ came is not our yoke. We are yoked to Christ. There's our liberty. There's our freedom. We are yoked to Christ. Acts chapter 15. And Jesus actually, by the way, I, I read that verse this morning, those verses this morning. In Matthew 11, and he uses the word yoke. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's the yoke we need. In Acts chapter 15, as the Jerusalem council, the church, the folks from Antioch came down, there's this council, they're dealing with this issue of of, of how do we deal? How do we, how do we, how do we answer these who are saying that it's necessary that we maintain the order of the old covenant as we come into the new covenant? Here's what Peter said. So, so, so Peter knew this. He kind of slipped a little bit in the Galatian, you know, in the Galatian letter. You see, he had to be kind of reprimanded by Paul, but sometimes it's hard to shake old old ways and old, th old thinking. In Acts chapter 15, or yeah, 15 verses 10 and 11, now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And that's very interesting, isn't it? We, who's he talking about? We, talking about Jews. We 
shall be saved in the same manner as they, the Gentiles. And that's interesting. You'd think it might be flipped the other way around, but no. No, because these Jews were misunderstanding the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so bound to Him by faith and with His Spirit in us, we live out that faith through love, as Paul says in Galatians 5, 6. The law written upon our hearts and minds is worked out in our lives in obedience to the law of Christ. His revelation to us is our absolute moral authority. We do have an absolute moral authority. It's just not whatever you might think or whatever you might feel. It's what God has said. Written upon your hearts, you long to be obedient to Him. The glory of the new covenant in Christ fulfills the dim shadows of the old covenant and frees us to rejoice. Listen to this. We rejoice in a certain, unchangeable, full, free, and forever salvation. Nothing can shake us from that. And yet we can get shaky. So Paul says, stand fast. Stand fast. We're not bound by any law to justify us before God. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith, by which Christ has made you free. Listen, if there was no new covenant in Christ, there would be no eternal salvation for anyone, Jew or Gentile. Our liberty is dependent upon Jesus Christ alone. And to add anything else is to take on a yoke of bondage. Remember that tonight. You don't have to take on anything else. You are yoked to Christ. But there's something else we need to remember. And whenever this subject is talked about in Scripture, it seems like Paul has to bring this balance of thought. He did so in Romans 5, 6, 7, 8. He does so here. And you see it, skipping down to verse 13. He says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. But there's a problem, isn't there? There's an inherent problem because of who we still are. We have not been delivered completely from this body of death, this flesh. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word... Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. There have been those who've preached messages on this and they've entitled it Christian Cannibalism. Tonight, remember this. There is liberty, but that liberty is not a license for the flesh. And this is a necessary warning. And church, we need this exhortation. We are freed by Christ, and we must stand firm in the liberty that is ours in Him and because of Him, but we must be on guard against our flesh. And I find it interesting. If Now, he goes on in verse 19. We've just looked at this recently. But the works of the flesh, and he gives us a list of the works of the flesh, right? And, and it's interesting to me when he says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Don't drink, don't cuss, don't smoke, don't, you know, go down your list, you know, don't fornicate, don't whatever. I mean, and, and those would be maybe... 
good things to say. But what does he, what does he single out here? He singles out relationships. Of all the things he could single out, he singles out relationships. Do you think that's significant? The Amplified. Brother Geary likes the Amplified. Let me give you the Amplified uh, translation here. But of verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another in partisan strife, be careful that you and your whole fellowship are not consumed by one another. Biting and devouring. It's graphic, isn't it? Expressing vicious attacks upon one another. Over what? Over what? Anything. Anything. And biting and devouring, what does that sound like? Does that sound like words? Not only what you say to somebody, but what you say about somebody. Biting and devouring. Relationships not motivated by serving one another in love. But controlled by self-serving pride. That has no real concern for the good of the other or the good of the whole. Or has an agenda... Doesn't know where to draw the lines. A lot of things can be said here. But may the Spirit of God speak to you and me as we think about this. I'm not condemned. I will not go to hell if I sin. I have liberty. I don't have to be placed under the bondage of a bunch of rules and regulations. But in the midst of that liberty, I better be careful. I don't have the liberty to, to do and say whatever I please, whenever I please. I don't have that. I've got to care about you. I've got to care about my spouse, my children, relationships. And I've got to speak in the context of that care. And when you push my button, I have no right to fire back at you. And I have no right to push your buttons. And sometimes we unintentionally do those things, don't we? And that's why love is so, so critical. We will not have relationships if we are not governed by the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, which he goes on to make a big deal of. And the end result is going to be, if we're not careful, consumed by one another. And the opposite of edifying, which is what we're supposed to be about as a church which is to characterize our relationships. And so church, I hope that we, I hope that we will receive this. I hope that we will evaluate this. Do not let a proper emphasis upon our liberty in Christ. You hear me? There is a prop, there needs to be an emphasis upon our liberty in Christ. We're under grace. But don't allow that to create a blind spot to the danger of our flesh that still wants to rule. 
The love of Christ must accompany the liberty that we have in Christ. Remember tonight as we join together to partake of these elements, we are bought by the same precious blood of Jesus Christ. It was His body that was broken for you, that was broken for me. We're together in this thing. He purchased you just like He purchased me. The same price for you was paid for me and vice versa. That ought to help us in our relationships to one another. We are free because of the liberty that He has secured for us. It's not because of who I am. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. We're, nah, perish that kind of thinking. Get rid of that kind of thinking. Let's help one another stand fast in this liberty and exercise toward one another the love His Spirit is producing in us. And if you're a Christian, His Spirit is producing love in you. Your responsibility is to exercise it. That's what Paul said in Galatians 5 and verse 6. Faith which works by love. And so I hope that our partaking together tonight will encourage us in this faith. Working through love.